Support for this program is provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation of Jennings. The Ziegler Museum is a cultural center for Southwest Louisiana, featuring European and American art and wildlife dioramas. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you. Hi, I'm Kelly Spires and welcome to Louisiana, the state we're in. This week, we sat down with Governor John Bell Edwards to talk about growing partisanship in Baton Rouge. We check in with the legislature where lawmakers have less than a week to conclude the state's business. Finally, we take a look at the science behind hurricane season. But first, some stories making headlines across our state. The state Senate's Budget Committee unveiled the upper chamber's $29 billion spending plan for the year that starts July 1st. They've reallocated over $200 million that House members wanted to leave out of the budget. House leaders think revenue projections could dip mid-year. Leaving money out of the spending plan on the front end could avoid cuts midway through the plan if that does happen. The Senate plan prevents some cuts to colleges, prisons, and social services. The House restored funding to TOPS, and it would remain fully funded under the Senate plan. Lawmakers have until June 8th to reconcile their differences. Southern University baseball coach Roger Cador is retiring after 33 years. Cador took over the team at his alma mater in 1984 after serving as assistant coach. Under Cador, Southern became the first historically black college baseball program to achieve an NCAA tournament postseason win in 1987. Cador is one of the winningest coaches in NCAA history with 913 wins overall. He led the Jags to 14 Southwestern Athletic Conference titles and 11 NCAA regional appearances. Cador's tenure produced 62 draft picks, including Ricky Weeks, the Golden Spikes award winner in 2003. That's given annually to the best amateur player in America. Weeks is the only player from an HBCU to ever win the award. In recent years, the program has hit rough times and is currently under NCAA sanctions for low academic progress rates. Kador will stay on with Southern for another year as special assistant to the athletic director to help with the program's transition. State Representative Ed Price, a Democrat from Gonzales, is the newest member of the Louisiana Senate. He replaces former state Senator Troy Brown, a Napoleonville Democrat who resigned in February after pleading no contest to allegations of domestic abuse. Price, a retired plant worker, won Brown's seat in a special election Saturday with 63 percent of the vote. He will serve out the remainder of Brown's term, which ends in January 2020. Price Senate District 2 includes parts of eight parishes, stretching from West Baton Rouge Parish, southeast to St. Charles and Lafouche Parishes. Scientists in Livingston are helping further prove Albert Einstein's theory of general relativity, identifying more ripples in the fabric of space-time. The Laser Inferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, also known as LIGO, announced this week its third detection of the gravitational waves Einstein first predicted more than a century ago. One of the two observatories LIGO uses to make such discoveries is located in Livingston, Louisiana. LSU professor Gabriela Gonzalez received much of the credit for LIGO's first detection of gravitational waves in September 2015. She was inducted into the National Academy of Sciences last month. Thursday, First Lady Donna Edwards and Governor Edwards dedicated the governor's mansion Rose Garden in honor of Rose Landry Long, State Senator Gerald Long's late wife. Miss Long died earlier this year. Rose Long, one of our longtime board members, was awarded Public Broadcasting Systems 2016 Grassroots Advocacy National Volunteer of the Year Award for her support of LPB. She served on the Friends of LPB board from 2010 to 2016. She was the chair of Louisiana Legends Gala from 2012 to 2015. As the legislative session wraps up, I sat down with Governor John Bell Edwards to talk about the friction between Democrats and conservative Republican leadership in the House. That has stymied most of his tax reform efforts in the Ways and Means Committee and produced what he's called an unworkable budget. There's just a week left to go before the session closes on Thursday. What needs to happen to get everybody on the same page about the budget before June 8th? 
the budget uh, as uh, contained in House Bill 1 today that the House of Representatives sent to the Senate as a non-starter. Uh, there is no way that's going to become law. I mean, it, it cuts more than $700 million out of health care. It doesn't uh, make specific cuts uh, really in any area. It directs the Commissioner of Administration, and thus myself, uh, to make cuts. And it's, it's just a very irresponsible uh, budget document. And I look forward to the Senate uh, improving it. And certain, uh, certainly there are limitations on what they can do because, as you know, the budget not only originates in the House, but so does all revenue measures. Um, and we needed about $400 million in revenue just to provide the same services as last year. Well, that's, that's not going to, to happen, and so we need to fashion a budget that is responsible under the circumstances. The first thing they're going to have to do is incorporate into the budget over $200 million that the House left unappropriated. There is a way, certainly, to responsibly fund TOPS. Uh, the shortfall in TOPS is about $80 million. Uh, the way the House of Representatives did it, uh, they simply took $240 million out of health care to get $80 million worth of TOPS. That doesn't make sense. And the reason that happens is when you take $80 million state general fund out of health care, uh, you forfeit uh, the federal dollars that that would bring down to the state of Louisiana. I think it would be worthwhile to talk about the friction in this building between the first, I mean, both chambers, the first and fourth floor, and the two parties. People are frustrated. I, I'm frustrated. Uh, you know, we, we came into office last year facing the largest a general fund deficit in the state's history. For the fiscal year that we're currently in, it was $2 billion, more than 20% of all state general fund. The House of Representatives insisted on a very short-term funding mechanism for state government, uh, and so it enacted a one-cent increase in the sales tax, which is the big revenue raiser, uh, that was going to last 27 months. But before the penny rolled off, they had committed to enacting uh, structural long-term uh, budget and tax reform, and in fact created a task force to study and make recommendations. And despite the fact that this is the last fiscal session, uh, they are not doing anything to address that fiscal cliff. That's not what we need. The state needs predictability and stability. And it doesn't come from that sort of, of, uh, of I think, irresponsible uh, behavior. The issue is on structural change in Louisiana, especially when you're talking about revenue, uh, it's a two-thirds vote that's required. And those measures have to start in the House. And so that's really the, the biggest part of the challenge is, is because you cede control of the issue to a minority. So that's what happens. And we do have uh, right now a, a level of partisanship in the legislature, uh, in state government, that, that is more than I have seen in my 10 years here. And I quite frankly don't think it, it's in our best interest. Um, I call upon people to be Louisianans first and not Democrats and Republicans, and we can get back to being uh, partisan in time for the next election, but right now we ought to be trying to solve our problems. If we need a special session, when will you call it, how long will it be, and what will be in the call? In terms of when the special session would occur, you know, we're sitting here uh, with not much time left in this session. If we don't get a budget bill, or we don't get one that I can sign, or a capital outlay bill, and as of right now, that's possible, I don't know how likely it is, we will go into a uh, special session right away because we need to get that done within this uh, time period that we have left before July 1st, which is the next fiscal year. If what we have to address is the fiscal cliff, then in all likelihood that special session won't occur till sometime this fall or very early next year uh, because we, we need some time, I think, to back up, sit down as leaders. Uh, try to come up with a common plan before we go back into that special session, I think that what's going to have to happen is we're going to have to get closer to July 1, 2018 in order for there to be an appropriate sense of urgency uh, to get people to take very seriously the need to address uh, the fiscal cliff. In terms of what will be in the call, that's going to be determined by how those discussions go, but clearly it will continue to be a combination of cuts, savings, and revenue but the revenue measures really ought to come from that task force report. That structural tax reform that incorporates best practices, many of which are straight out of the conservative playbook of broadening the base for our taxes and lowering the rates. Uh, that's what we need to be doing. We can do it in the sales tax. We can do it in the individual income tax. We can do it in the corporate income tax. 
Um, those are the options that we'll have before us. Hopefully we can move forward. I want to talk a little bit about this partisanship. Um, if you sit in a Ways and Means me meeting, you know, you, you hear um, folks who are Democrats talk about the lack of funding for state services, and you hear Republicans talk about um, how stalled the economy is. Do you think that this, these are narratives that, or that there's something behind them? Do you think that these pictures that can be reconciled? First of all, we have to act, and you've got to have consensus, and, and, and you don't have to have unanimity, but you have to have enough people coming together who embrace a common plan because the status quo isn't working for us. We have to move forward. You can't move forward if one side doesn't even have a plan because you've got to be able to have t at least two plans, uh, set them side by side, see where there's overlap, do the things where there's agreement. Uh, where there's not agreement, you have to continue to talk and try to, to find common ground. Uh, that's very, very difficult to do if, if one side just rejects everything that they're, they're offered and doesn't propose their own plan. Now, the fact of the matter is it's very difficult. You can't have the largest budget deficit in the history of the state and think it's going to be easy to solve. You have to have a balanced approach where you, you do it with revenue, you do it with cuts, and you do it with savings. Uh, but we have to be able to come together uh, to make that happen. And, and certainly people with different, of different parties have different philosophies in many cases. But you still have to be able to sit down and work it out. And, and we are going to get it done. Unfortunately, the legislature isn't wanting to do that now, which is when we should do it in this last fiscal session before the fiscal cliff. Uh, they're not going to do it. That's pretty apparent now. Now, the good news is it's some more reason to believe that our, that our uh, situation here in Louisiana has stabilized. Uh, certainly, I hope that to be the case and, and that we can move forward and actually start growing our economy again. You know, unemployment is actually down since I've been governor, but I don't want to act like that's great news in and of itself because I know that there's too much underemployment within those numbers. And we have a lot of people in Louisiana who are hurting. I fully get that. Uh, you've got individuals, especially in the oil and gas sector, who now may be working but they're working for maybe half of the pay that they, they were getting uh, in their old jobs. And so we've got a lot of work to do in Louisiana. I'm cognizant of that. Uh, I'm going to continue to work extremely hard. But the way forward is for the leadership, Republican, Democrat, House and Senate, and myself to sit down and, and forge a, a compromise, a consensus, if you will, so that we can, we can move forward together. Changes were slim out of the Ways and Means Committee over the past seven weeks. What do you feel like you need to do and what needs to happen to see more movement, see that change in a special? You got to put it in context. This is the fiscal session where the House leadership pledged to enact comprehensive long-term uh, tax reform and then didn't do it. So obviously the dynamics have to change and I'm going to continue to meet with leadership in the House and the Senate, Republican and Democrat to try to figure out how we can best do that. But ultimately, they're going to have to decide that they want to act and that they need to act. Obviously, the, the conversation is going to have to be a little better because uh, the House leadership clearly indicated, not just to me, but to the entire state, uh, that we were going to create this task force, study it, have them make recommendations, and then in this session, when we're currently, the one we're currently in, that we would be taking these actions. Uh, so obviously we have to do better. I'm committing myself to do that and we're going to have many more conversations about this. Um, but, but, you know, there is no magical formula. You just have to have leadership uh, that actually leads. It's been reported that the House Democrats didn't necessarily work with your administration when they voted against House Bill 3, which is um, a bill that finances construction projects. Yeah. Um, what do you think about that? They were registering some concerns that they've gotten with the way the House is being led, uh, with the lack of communication uh, between um, the Speaker uh, and the Democrats and some of the things that, that uh, are taking place there. Uh, and so that's internal to the House. Uh, I have to assume that they're going to work that out. But there are some real structural problems, you know, for, that they are complaining about, which, by the way, I, I think are legitimate. If you look at the Appropriations Committee, 
um, which is arguably the most important committee in the entire legislature uh, in the House of Representatives, uh, there are 19 Republicans and six Democrats. Well, the split in the overall body is 60-40. And so that is a level of partisanship. That is hyper-partisan. You wouldn't even see that uh, in Washington, D.C. It's way out of kilter and, and it's unfair. And I think, by the way, it's, it's, it's responsible to some degree for the, for the problems that we are having, the dysfunction that we, we're having. Uh, and, and I know that the House Democrats are wanting the Speaker to address that. I happen to think the Speaker should. Um, but that is internal to the House, and they're going to have to figure out uh, uh, for themselves a way forward. Are you worried that the criminal justice package will get caught up in budget negotiations? No, I, I'm really not. I think, uh, you know, that is incredibly important. It's a bipartisan support. Uh, we've got the business community. We've got the religious right, the religious left think tanks like Pew Charitable Trust, the Pelican Institute out of New Orleans. It really does run the, the entire political spectrum. Uh, and in fact, the DAs are in support of the package. The, the sheriffs are neutral. That required an awful lot of work. Uh, we've got it in a, in a great position where over 10 years, uh, we're going to reduce, over the next 10 years, reduce our incarceration rate by at least 10 percent, save more than $260 million, uh, and then reinvest more than 180 of that into our system, some of which will be re reinvested into our juvenile system, which really makes an awful lot of sense. And we are focusing on nonviolent offenders, and we're looking at the drivers of our incarceration rate, typically uh, low-level drug crimes and nonviolent property crimes. Uh, and we're only doing those things that have been successfully done in other Southern conservative states uh, who did these things years ago. Uh, you know, we don't have more crime than those other states, but we're locking up two to three times as many people. It just doesn't make sense. Ninety-five percent of those people are going to get out of prison. And we're not doing what we need to do to make sure that that reentry is successful. And every time a reentry is unsuccessful, we create another victim of crime. So we have to do better. Uh, we can ultimately spend less and do better. And that, that's the path that we're on. And so I believe, um, as I'm talking to you right now, that, that we're in good shape on that criminal justice reinvestment task force um, legislative package. Since the time of this interview, Governor Edwards has issued a call for a special session immediately following the regular session's scheduled adjournment on June 8th. That's if lawmakers don't get everything done. The clock is ticking to do so before the deadline next Thursday. Lawmakers from both sides of the aisle are frustrated that the state's looming budget deficit won't be fixed. Legislators have made progress on the criminal justice reform bills. There aren't many rocks left to turn over if lawmakers are looking to reform the state's tax code. The legislature formed a task force that spent six months studying it. The governor offered a package of bills, and a lone lawmaker, Republican Barry Ivey from Central, gave reform a shot on the House floor on Tuesday. If this doesn't get out of here, then, then I don't know what the point is. If we're not going to try to solve our tax policy issue now, we're not going to do it in a special session. It won't be possible. Ivy spent months working over the tax code himself to bring forward solutions. He crafted bills based on the task force's report. That task force was created by the legislature through a resolution last year. If you read the actual resolution, it speaks to the intent to come this session with reform. The lawmaker vented to his colleagues that they are wasting time and yielding their power to the governor. I'm not coming back for a special session this year, okay? I came to work this session. If we have every tool at our disposal this fiscal session, but we have not the will to solve the problem, when the governor gives us a special session with a limited call and puts two or three tools on the table, then how are we going to solve the problem? Though several of Ivy's proposals stalled on Tuesday night, a bill for a flat corporate income tax gained approval Wednesday. Representative Neil Abramson, a Democrat from New Orleans, thinks the tax system is too broken to fix with a package of bills. He suggested rewriting the state constitution. The crisis that we face is a financial crisis. The limited constitutional convention would allow us to address that. Abramson calls for a study into Article 7 of the Constitution about the state's revenue and finance to see if a convention is necessary. Then delegates from around the state would meet to rewrite it. If you like the current system and you are afraid of what the future may hold if we try to fix it, then vote against it. But if you, if you, if you think the current system is broken 
and you want to create a process to reform it and change it, I think this is it. Ultimately, that bill failed as well. However, the House did come together to pass a package of bipartisan bills to reform criminal justice law. Representative Steve Dwight, a conservative from Lake Charles, brought one of the bills. This bill is easy. You know, that they've described the House bills from, from this package as, as the low-hanging fruit. And if you look at mine, mine's barely off the ground. Many bills in the package aim to help the offender in some way, from reducing recidivism to overhauling sentencing. But Dwight's bill aims to make life for victims of crimes a little easier. Dwight says the Sheriff's Association asked him to carry this bill. When they came to me to, to bring part of this package, I, I hesitated a little bit, but when they told me it was for victims, I was all in. And, that, and that's what my bill does, is to give victims more of a role and more of a voice in, in this process. Senate bills contain a heftier part of the reform package and are making their way through the process as well. The House and Senate and Democrats and Republicans continue to negotiate on details of the spending plan for the budgeting period that begins July 1st. If lawmakers can't agree on a budget and other mandatory bills, they'll have to come back into a special session immediately. Governor John Bell Edwards plans to call lawmakers back to Baton Rouge in the fall or early next year to discuss tax reform. June 1st marked the start of hurricane season. Louisiana is lucky to have avoided a storm classified as major for the last 11 years. We sat down with Barry Keim, the state climatologist, to talk about what Louisiana can expect this summer. The National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, or NOAA, is predicting an above average hurricane season. What they're calling for is 11 to 17 named storms. Barry Keim is the state climatologist. 12 is the long-term average, so 11 to 17 uh, puts us in, in this range. Obviously, if it's 11, it's slightly below normal, but if we took the midpoint, that'd be around 14. That would be above normal if 12 is the long-term average, and if we're at 17, we're really starting to push up you know, a pretty busy year. This year is expected to see a normal or slightly above normal number of hurricanes. Now, of those 11 to 17, they expect 5 to 9 to become hurricanes, and of those five to nine hurricanes, they expect two to four to become major hurricanes. In an average or normal year, there are about three major hurricanes. That's a storm that's a category three or above. El, El Nino and La Nina play a very big role in how our hurricane seasons play out. We tend to get fewer hurricanes during El Ninos. We get more hurricanes during La Ninas. El Nino is the clockwise rotation of ocean currents across the Pacific and off the coast of Peru and Chile. La Niñas occur when the current is counterclockwise. As El Niños create lots of wind shear over the breeding grounds in the Atlantic, and that tends to mitigate the number of storms that we have. La Niña, on the other hand, does the exact opposite. It creates very, very favorable upper air conditions for the formation of hurricanes. The prediction for this year is a weak or non-existent El Niño. A strong El Niño would mitigate the number and severity of storms. So basically, we're not going to have the, that insurance policy. We won't have the protection from the El Nino this year. So El Nino is a non-factor, basically. There's another thing that above average seasons have. Hurricane breeding grounds are where storms form. The second factor is that the sea surface temperatures over the, the main breeding grounds, parts of the Atlantic and across the Caribbean, are running near normal to slightly above. And so that's another indicator that uh, this, this could be a, you know, a normal to a slightly above normal season. Keim says the models for the season have a lot of uncertainty. Scientists aren't sure whether the season will be above average. So right now, they're, they're predicting a 45 percent chance that we'll have an above normal season, but a 55 percent chance that it will be either normal to below normal. So, uh, so this is not a given uh, that, that it's going to be you know, this really, really busy year. Having an above average season doesn't spell catastrophe for Louisiana. There's a little bit of cause for concern. We had 15 named storms last year, though. That's an above normal season, and we didn't get any activity here in Louisiana then either. But obviously, the more storms that are produced, that's that many more storms that we have to dodge. And Louisiana has fared poorly in below normal years. We've been hitting quiet years. 1992, seven named storms. Well, one of those was Andrew. Uh, 1965 was also a pretty quiet year, and Betsy rolled up on our shores and just crushed New Orleans. And in 1957, we had a, a, a quiet year, and Audrey rolled up on our shores, just you know, putting a pretty good uh, smack down on southwest Louisiana. Louisiana and the United States have been lucky to have a quiet spell. No major hurricane has hit this country since Wilma in October in 2005. We have not had a major hurricane since the Katrina-Rita season. 
And that's just mind blowing to me. Uh, the longest we've gone, you know, since say 1900 was about a five year stretch without a major hurricane uh, landfall. Up until this run right now, we're 11 years in and still counting. But storms that aren't major can still do damage. We have had some catastrophic hurricanes that have hit our shores. Gustav, we know what that did to Baton Rouge. That was only a category two, so we don't count it as a major hurricane. And just like shooting dice, the previous rule has no effect on the probability of the next. Every year has the same probability, essentially, okay? And uh, we get hit on average about once every other year in the state. And any given location in the state can expect to experience uh, you know, a strike, if you will, maybe once every three years. The season ends every year on November 30th. 2017 has already seen its first named storm, Tropical Storm Arlene, which died out in the Atlantic in April. Brett will be the name of the first storm of the official season. That's our show for this week. Remember, you can catch LPB on demand on your phone or tablet with our LPB Anywhere app. The download is free from your app store. You can catch LPB news and public affairs shows as well as other Louisiana programs. Please like us on Facebook as well. From everyone at Louisiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Kelly Spires. Thanks for watching. Until next time, that's the state we're in. We'd like to hear from you. Write Louisiana, the state we're in, 7733 Perkins Road in Baton Rouge. Call toll-free 1-800-272-8161. Email LPB. Check us out on Facebook and Twitter. And visit our website at lpb.org to view your favorite stories again. This and other editions are available on home video. Support for this program is provided by the Fred B. and Ruth B. Ziegler Foundation of Jennings. The Ziegler Museum is a cultural center for Southwest Louisiana, featuring European and American art and wildlife dioramas. Additional support provided by the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting and viewers like you.